Thank you very much, Patrick, and thank you, everybody. That was the Freudian slip, if there ever was one, wasn't it? Um, I will no doubt make several more in the course of my, my presentation. So uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's an absolute privilege. And it's the culmination for me of two years' work. Uh, and some of you have seen this. I know some of you were sent a copy of this. I'm not sure why it's whizzing. I didn't make it whiz. Is that you at the back? Okay. Um, so this is uh, a product from the PhD Foundation. They very kindly funded me. And my colleague, uh, Dr. Philip Begley, who uh, can't be here with us today, to do a piece of research that really looked at the policy history um, behind genetics and genomics. It's very much a UK focus to the book, has got a little bit of uh, international context in it as well. And this, I think, is the first study uh, of this, this really vital topic. Um, and I was surprised, actually, when I did the, you know, the literature search that nobody had really brought this together before. And I think, hopefully, some of you in the room will find it useful. So just a little bit about the practicalities of how we ran this project, because I think this is important because there is no such thing as the history of genetics and genomics. There are only other histories, and they will be contested, and they will continue to change as you folk in the room do the amazing work, such as stuff that Dennis was telling us about this morning, that continually changes our expectations. So it is the first history, but it is only um, one of many, I think, so in terms of the methodology for this project, uh, we set up an advisory group. Three members are here today, I'm really pleased to see. Diana Walford, um, Sir Keith Peters, and Ron Zimmern, and sadly Martin Bobro can't be with us today. And they were really critical to opening up the community that you are in um, to engaging with the project. We did 47 interviews, one-to-one -one interviews, and then we did two witness seminars. And if you're not familiar with the concept of a witness seminar, um, this is where you bring together a group of individuals who've been involved in a policy development or a, a crisis, and you really get them to test out what happened and what didn't and who made things happen. Uh, and a number of colleagues in the room participated in those. So my job, I think, in this panel is really just to set up a bit of the context for then what Claire and John are going to go on to talk about. Um, and I'm going to do it with a series of provocations. Um, and my first one is this, which is a cartoon from the New Yorker from the year 2000, which, of course, and sorry, because my, my editing is so feeble, I managed to cut off the bottom of the Y, but this woman is appearing in a pharmacy um, at the prescription counter, and she's saying to the pharmacist, here's my DNA sequence. So this is 2000. It's the year that we have the first draft sequencing of the human genome. And the, the, the sort of the, the public expectation is, is mixed. You know, is this going to change things overnight? Or is everything going to go on as normal? And I think what we've seen over the last 23 years is that some things have changed in a big way, and other things have pretty gone, much gone on as normal, particularly going to your pharmacist. So... Things such as the sequencing of the uh, human genome were really just the tip of a huge iceberg that the public doesn't see in terms of scientific progress. They get obsessed with small things, um, what we probably think are small things, cloning Dolly the sheep, 1996. But as genes have become identified and associated with certain health conditions, whether it's muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, they have been intermittently engaged with some of what we call LCs, um, ethics, legal, social implications of those initiatives and discoveries. And I think it's fair to say that policymakers, politicians, have been even less committed and consistent in their focus um, on genetics and genomics discoveries. And there has been, I think, uh, a naivety in our understanding of how policymaking happens. Uh, who's involved? 
the process, the organisations behind it. Uh, we may uh, reassure ourselves that there is a strong evidence base to policy making or that we are policy informed. But it's not a linear translation process from the science into the policy. And I think what our research has done over the last two years is really to demonstrate the points at which that process breaks down. But hopefully also how you can make better policy making if you understand the limitations of those systems. And there's lots of theory now about how good policy making should happen. There's a brilliant model by John Kingdon called Multiple Streams Analysis, where he says there are three, three streams flowing along each side, um, the problem stream, the politics stream, and the policy stream. And it's only when you get a convergence of those three streams, and they coincide with what he calls as a window of opportunity, that you can get effective policy change happening. If you try to do it out of that cycle, it's not going to work. But that's the theoretical approach. So I'm going to take you through just a few quick examples of where that has not happened, or it has happened in terms of the British context. Uh, we also know that we've started from different points of view on this. We have the clinician geneticist community. We have the scientific community. We have the policymakers. They've all come into this with different approaches. My next slide is a quote from one of my, my panelists. I warned him this morning about this. This is what John said when we did the witness seminar uh, last year. And I think it's really instructive, you know. And I love, the, I love the metaphors that you're using here, John. You know, we were finding genes, and I'm trying not to do your voice, but you were really quite passionate about this in the room. You know, um, you know it's, things were happening separate to the human genome problem. <coughs> Initially, a whole bunch of yanks linking old bits of DNA together. In a sense, they were sort of bletchley parked, us being in the Marines. We were out fighting. We knew those guys were cracking codes and stuff, which was great. We didn't really get that involved with them. So that's maybe the 1990s. So how did things then move on from there? And what made things move on from there? Um, well, the UK Department of Health at that time really wasn't fascinated at all by genetics. Um, it took a lot of effort by civil servants to keep it on the policy agenda. Um, talking to Mark Bale about constant challenges of getting it onto um, ministers' attention um, select committees had relatively little success at that time. So what is needed, really, and this comes back to the theoretical approach, are what we call policy entrepreneurs, that great set of individuals with really quite unique skills who bring things together in exciting ways. Now, you will all recognise the chap, um, looking slightly younger, I have to say, <laughs> on the left. Who I think is known everybody in the world, the international community of genetics and genomics knows Ron Zimmern. And Ron, we know how you have been the founding father of what has been known as public health genetics, public health genomics. And that came very much from your disciplinary base in public health, with a touch of legal training as well, and this fascination with how you could bring public health together with genetics and genomics. The other chap on the slide, for those of you who don't recognise him, is Moon Khoury, who is doing exactly the same thing as Ron, but in the US, working through CDC um, and really pushing the US um, with provocative papers. His 1996 paper in the American Journal of Public Health, which was called From Genes to Public Health, really lit that fuse on, on getting this thing started. And he founded, or he created, persuaded the CDC to set up an office for genomics and public health at the same time, pretty much, that Ron was persuading people like Keith here in Cambridge to put some funding behind the first public health genetics unit, which was created in 1997. The other thing that policy entrepreneurs do really well is networking at, in wonderful places, so this is Rockefeller Center, Bellagio, in 2005. Uh, and Ron convened this meeting and brought together a group of international um, colleagues. 
And the purpose of the meeting was to come up with a definition for public health genomics. And it's here, the responsible, effective translation of the genome-based knowledge and technologies for the benefit of population health. There's lots of contested terms in there, whether it's public health, population health, uh, genome-based rather than genetics. But it then really initiated a whole series of valuable pieces of work, some done by the PhD Foundation, that looked at um, how you could bridge that divide between individual and population health, how you develop a solid evidence base for testing, for screening, how you get the appropriate regulatory frameworks in place, and how you integrate the LCs. There are other policy entrepreneurs uh, I didn't put alongside Ron and Muin because I don't think he's quite on the same status. Um, it comes back to Patrick's Freudian slip earlier. I didn't put John Bell on there, but perhaps I should have done because John was doing things in Oxford in, in a very similar model um, and equally effective in terms of building those links into the policymaking community. So where do you go if you want influence? Um, well, you probably need to start with your Secretary of State. Uh, but to put this into context, uh, when I did a, a study of the Chief Medical Officers a few years ago, I had fun calculating the average tenure of the Secretary of State for Health relative to the tenure for the Chief Medical Officer. Sally, I'm not going to give you yours, but it's a long one, isn't it? Yep. Um, so just, just for your information, the tenure, average tenure now for the Secretary of State for Health in this country 27 months. That has been pulled down significantly. <laughs> Does anybody remember the shortest one? Therese Coffey, and she was in office for seven weeks. The longest is Jeremy Hunt at five years, seven months. So we have a wide spectrum. So why am I saying this? Because you have to be aware as a, a policy entrepreneur that your audience will change. And you've got to be prepared for the next one who's going to step into that role. But they're important people. So one thing that Milburn did was in a speech in 2001 um, was to announce that the Department of Health's genetic policy unit would be expanded, uh, that they were going to create six genetics knowledge parks, including Cambridge, and also set up the UK Genetic Testings Network. But there were issues around pace and sustainability. So they let the GKNs run for five years and then reviewed and decided that possibly they weren't quite focused enough in the way that they could make best use of that MRC funding. There was a 2003 white paper, Our Inheritance, Our Future, that looked at what should be happening with genetics in the NHS. In 2006, they stopped the genetics knowledge parks but they did start the UK Biobank. And then in 2009, the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee, which I think, Keith, you were on at the time, really put a, um, no, it wasn't Keith, it was Norman on it, really sort of put a rocket up the Department of Health and said, you know, you're not just not innovating with PCR technology fast enough. We've got all of these innovations. We're not seeing that being translated through quickly enough into policy. But all the way through, there's the value of those independent voices, such as the PhD Foundation. So you aim for influence with your Secretary of State, but if you can get it, you aim for the person in the top post. And when David Cameron became Prime Minister, he had a very personal um, interest in genetics and genomics, as people in the room, I think, will, will understand. Um, but his motivation was also economic. So he was very keen to build on what Sir David Cooksey had started back in 2006 and to look at the potential to actually get investment generated on the back of scientific breakthroughs. And that's, you know, the, I won't go over the ground that other people have spoken about today, but that 100,000 Genomes project was really a very effective way to do that, particularly by doing a spin-out company, Genomics England, set up in 2013. And of course, then chief medical officers have played their own role. So Sally's 2016 report uh, 
uh, generation genome was key, and the authors that you selected, again, were key to looking at how we maintain the momentum around this. So there is, I think, an emerging consensus that science has to move in partnership with the LCs. That terminology is critical. We can't just use the US terms such as precision public health. They don't mean so much in our UK environment. Um, and language, I think, has become even more um, crucial as we have seen over the last three years. And sometimes it takes a crisis to make us rethink what our risks are risk appetites are and it has been a step change for the public and the public now on the back of what we've been through are really quite au fait with terms such as PCR. LFT no longer means liver function test um, but something completely different but it also I think has exposed for the public <laughs> concerns about how governments use science, how governments use knowledge and what is timely incorporation. So we heard a lot in the, this is from the dismal early start, this is from March 2020, when Boris Johnson was quite often telling us, you know, we are following the science, we're following the science. Um, and it, it exposed that actually they might be following some science, but the scientists and certainly some of the staff working in Public Health England had found that they just didn't have the resources that they thought they would have. But this is where genetics and genomics has really, I think, um, become socialised for the public. So the public are now much more accepting that we will test them. They, they will be agree to be tested. And that's something that we did in Liverpool. We did the pilot, the lateral flow testing for asymptomatic community testing. Um, and we could only do that because we had previously built on uh, testing for tuberculosis. Liverpool did a pilot in 1956 in which we did miniature x-rays of half a million people in six weeks and uncovered significant numbers of, of asymptomatic TB cases. The point I'm making is that you need the public trust, you need the public buy-in, and I think you have to put a lot of effort into maintaining that. So to conclude then, um, why are these types of historical studies helpful? Are they helpful? We can maybe ask chat GBT that later. Um, I do believe that they are. I think they, they're a window of opportunity to come back to Kingdom that lets policymakers take a wider view to think how have we done things before? What is the evidence base? Um, are we really being good practitioners when we're developing our, our, our policies. And I think as we saw this morning when Dame June and, and, and Dame Sue were talking, and I'll go back to this cartoon for my final one, we haven't been fast enough. We need to look again at how you speed up that translation. We need to think again about how much of policy development is funding related or public appetite related. We need to push those conventional policy models and blur the boundaries between the organisations that work together. And in all of this, it is individuals who are most important, not just the individuals in our populations, but the individuals who make this happen. So whether it's Ron um, in public health, whether it's Dennis in his laboratory, uh, they have common traits, they have perseverance, they have patience, and they're political with a small p. And I think if we can look at them as models, we can learn a lot about how we can have more effective policy making. And that's certainly the mission I think that I see PhD Foundation taking forwards over the next 25 years. Thank you. <laughs>